Hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome. So excited for you to join us this morning. I'm Ryan Peterson. Uh, I'm the founder and CEO of Flexport. And I want to, again, thank you for joining us today to chat about bringing logistics technology to Toronto. And uh, I'm joined today by Stephanie Lapierre, if you can correct my French accent. Stephanie is the founder and CEO of Tealbook, uh, which is a Toronto-based supply chain technology company. And Stephanie, thank you for being here today. I want to pass over to you to give a quick introduction of yourself and, and Tealbook for those in the Toronto supply chain tech community. Everybody should be aware of this company. Uh, it's, it's, go ahead, tell us about your company, Stephanie. Yeah, thanks, Ryan, for having me. I'm super excited about today's conversation. So uh, Tealbook aggregates uh, data on every B2B company in the world. And so we use machines to identify what qualifies as a B2B supplier. We want to know where they're based, what they do, where they do business, who are the people, what are they certified for, who's affiliated, who's most similar. And so we seeded this uh, enormous uh, global network of suppliers so that we can take large master data of companies that do business with tens to hundreds of thousands of suppliers globally, and we turn the light on. So we show them uh, a lot about the companies that they do business with in a way that's autonomously enriched, that can feed their systems, can unify the data across all the software that typically collects different data points. So that gives them the mechanism to improve the quality of the information over time. It gives them a consolidated view of their entire supplier base, um, and it allows them to capitalize on this enormous investment that they've made on these suppliers so that they can uh, you know, drive to, towards their business outcome, that it could be consolidation, relocalization, uh, risk mitigation, ESG, et cetera. And we also have an application that empowers people across the organization to access the information about the suppliers they do business with, as well as expand so that they can introduce competition, innovation, and et cetera. So we're based in Toronto. We, uh, we are just over 100 employees now, and uh, we are uh, fundraised. We just recently fundraised, and we're growing uh, quite fast. That's awesome. Uh, I feel like data is the hardest thing in supply chain. Ultimately, we're talking about a data problem of how do you get all these different companies to talk to each other and, and be able to exchange data seamlessly. It seems like the, the problem at the end of the day for all of us. Yeah, I mean, one of the biggest challenges that we've seen is just with the amount of information that, that needs to be collected on every supplier in the world when you do business, there's so much. And traditionally, it's been collected through software, which you know, when you when you when you collect a lot of different software and the complications of being in the enterprise, you have multiple systems. And so, when you're collecting information and you rely on services, on integrations, on suppliers to come to various portals, it makes it incredibly challenging to have uh, inf the data that you need at this speed and scale. And what we've seen, and we've, we'll talk about in great lengths today, is the last couple of years the amount of disruption and uh, changes that are happening in the market. Uh, you know, the enterprise is looking for a faster way to access this data so that they can make better decisions. But listen, Ryan, I'd love to turn it on to you and, and, and tell us more about Flexport and what got you into this space in the first place. Yeah, so I, I spent my, it, it all makes sense in hindsight. You go back and look at my career. I've spent my whole entire professional life at the intersection of global trade and the internet. I think um, global trade's probably the most underrated force for good in the world that we lifted over the globalization ship. I would argue no technology in the last 50 years lifted more people out of poverty than the shipping container. And, you know, we lowered the price of shipping goods by something like 95% or more uh, globally. We enabled free market economics across the world, especially China, but other regions adopting trade and then being able to participate in the global economy so that anyone can buy good, buy or sell goods to their ideal customer anywhere in the world. It's incredibly powerful. Um, I, my background, I started out uh, as, a, as an entrepreneur, as an importer of motorcycles 20 years ago. I was the first dealer in the United States for Geely. Um, doesn't sound like a technology company, but actually we built a, quite a lot of technology. Geely is the Chinese car company that bought Volvo, by the way. Um, and so we were not selling their cars, we were selling their motorcycles. And it doesn't sound like a tech company, but we built quite a lot of tech to run the business, to, we, we could, it was like early, late 90s, early 2000s, and we were building web-based applications to manage all of our inventory, ship things, you know, coordinate with local, with trucking, we, we were able to integrate our software with trucking companies, uh, e-commerce checkout software, we could have been NetSuite, we could have been software, uh, um, Shopify, 
we ended up just selling crappy motorcycles. It wasn't a great business, but we learned so much. And one of the things we learned was global logistics, like shipping this stuff was one of the hardest problems. We just felt like, you know, um, first of all, there were two big problems I saw in the, in, in this space with dealing with freight forwarding companies. Number one was a lack of technology. There was no da- dashboard to log into. No one could show me where my stuff was on a map. There was no communication tools, very little data, very little ability to generate reports, sort of like fundamental stuff that technology should be able to do for, for a company in our How state. long ago was yeah. that? Not that long ago, right? Uh, this was early 2000s. Uh, we started a company in 1999. And, um, you know, and around the same time, Shopify, uh, well before Shopify, around the time NetSuite, I think Salesforce was founded in 97 or 99, I forget. We, I mean, we, my, and my brother and I are software engineers, so we built this like, pretty awesome web-based software that not, uh, you know, could have been something great. The business was not great. I'm not going to lie. Um, but we learned a lot. And I think that's the most important thing. So the first thing we learned was like, there was lack of tech in the industry, but actually just as important, we felt, I didn't see the customer ethos, like this customer obsession of George Bernard Shaw says, every profession is a conspiracy against the lay and against the laity and it felt like freight forwarding to me as a customer of the freight forwarders was kind of a poster child for that there's all these acronyms and weird terms um viking english you know even the term a bill of lading that we're all familiar with like the word is in english is loading like lading is some kind of old english (laughs) like what are we doing here so and and that's fine but as an as an outsider as a customer of those companies i felt like now my working model is that these are rookie detectors. Like if you have to ask what a bill of lading is, I'll, the, as a freight, the freight forwarding world will tell you what a bill of lading is, but then they're going to raise your prices because you obviously don't know what's going on here. And I, I felt like there was this real opportunity to sort of do marketing as education, teach people how things work, shine a light into the black box of global trade. Um, and, the, and, and tech is really good at this. You can have tool tips, you can have glossaries, you can have, um, just great messaging systems, great customer. Uh, and, and But it's not just tech. It's got to be a culture of people who are like, hey, we actually want to partner with our customers, help them grow, solve problems, and make money. We're going to make a lot of money, but over the long term by helping you grow your business instead of like, how can I take advantage of the information asymmetry and make make more money on this shipment because you don't know what's going on, and I do. Um, so I, I really started the business out of frustration that I felt that, you know, it's like, it's just a better, it has to be a better way. I didn't know all the stuff that I know now, which is that it's an incredibly complex chain. Your freight forwarding company doesn't do all the stuff. Like they have to, I I now joke, it should be called freight email forwarding because they have to, you have to connect with the ocean carrier, the trucking company, customs broker, airline, warehouses. Like it's a very complex chain and, and therefore tech is really important to how do you unify these people? How do you bring them together to share data seamlessly? How do you connect those factories that, you know, you all have such great data on, with the with the brands with the companies and allow them to communicate exchange data and and really transactionally it's very expensive to be having humans shuffle data around the world including in physical pieces of paper sometimes um less and less but still you know i made a joke i i I didn't make a joke i posted on the internet something about fax machines i was kind of poking fun at freight forwarding businesses and i think the ceo of one of the largest freight forwarders in the world reposted my linkedin and said i was wrong they don't use fax machines except in their Japan office where they still use. And I was just like, dude, you, you're missing the whole point. Like your Japan office is clearly not using the same technology as the rest of the offices. Like something's off here. Uh, so I, I still think there's, I'm not claiming we've solved this at Flexport, but there's the, the problem space is super interesting and there's so much progress still to be made. And can you walk me through like how our customers um, engaging, especially now you're coming to Canada and I want to talk more about why and what you're looking to achieve here, but um, yeah, just make, maybe walking us through the journey with Flexport. What does that look like? Yeah, well, so, you know, the, what is a brand trying to solve for? I mean, everyone cares about low cost. And I think automation, we all know that humans doing manual labor is expensive. And so if we can, if we can, not, not manual blue collar labor, but manual sort of back office labor, pushing emails around, uh, you know, data, data entry, communication with truckers, with carriers, with all the different things. If you can bring technology to share de- data seamlessly, you save a lot of money. Everybody cares about saving money. Um, and I think as we've gotten bigger, we've also been able to buy freight cheaper. Uh, not all the time, but you know, as we get bigger, we're, we are on average able to buy freight cheaper from motion carriers, from airlines, et cetera. 
we can pass through some of those savings to customers and drives a great flywheel. Um, by the way, our goal is not to be the pay the least for ocean freight, but we, you know, we want to actually, I, I hope that our business model allows us to pay the most for ocean freight while still giving great deals to the customer because we automate so much of the labor costs. I think that's a, it has to be number one and a big focus area, but, but as important and what we're trying to show customers is that you, your vi visibility, where is your stuff? When is it going to arrive? Predictive analytics, use machine learning to predict transit times harder than ever right now. Um, we will talk about that, all the congestion and, and supply chain challenges that are, we're facing, but um, being able to show people visibility and then control. Um, it's one thing to know where your stuff is. It's another thing. Hey, there's a problem. I need to take action. And so you see a lot. I'm a big believer that you want your visibility platform to come from a, your execution platform a, a, as, as a unified system, because it, it's one thing to see where all the stuff is and what the problems are. And then what, you know, and you want to be able to like, okay, I've got a problem. Let me act on it. This shipment's late. Oh, I need to reroute it. Let me ship it over here. So give people more control than they've ever had over their supply chain. Um, that's more important than ever in the e-commerce world where, you know, supply chain managers are under a huge amount of pressure because in the old world, you could have one distribution center and serve the whole country. And, you know, a week or two of shipping time was fine. Now, if you're trying to hit a two hour delivery window, you need to have a lot more inventory scattered in a lot more places. We, in, the, in the tech world, we call this edge caching, sort of positioning your content, your, in this case, your, your, your products close to the end user. And that's a, a much harder problem and one that machines are really good at and humans aren't that good at managing. Um, giving people better options, more flexibility, that's the, the flex and flex part. Uh, and then a big part also is, is working capital. You know, be able to, one of the things that logistics managers often fail to do, we're, we're, they tend to be comped, I don't know, like literally comp, but measured on their procurement costs, like how much are you spending on freight? Right. It makes sense. But in reality, very few are, are the more sophisticated ones. And we're trying to help all of our customers become more sophisticated are, are recognizing that actually the cost of your inventory itself, just sitting there on the water is very expensive if it's slow. And if we can speed that up for you and there are ways to do that, that your CFO is going to get really excited. If I can reduce the amount of inventory you have sitting on the on the water, improve the turns of your inventory. This is, um, you know, operations management sort of 101, but, uh, but a lot of the pure procurement folks in logistics only care about cost. And obviously cost is important, but you try to educate people. Hey, if we can, if I, how much is it worth to you if I can get your stuff there, you know, 30% faster. That's 30% less inventory sitting on the water. You can, your CFO can do the math. And, and now all of a sudden we help up-level logistics people to have strategic conversations with their CFO and, um, so we want to make our customers heroes, obviously, internally and externally. Um, so these are some of the things that you can do with tech. Ultimately, the journey is you come on the board to Flexport. You can use our order management system to place orders to your factories, to your suppliers around the world. Uh, factories receive those orders, acknowledge them, maybe haggle over them. I've been wanting to add like a, I used to live in Shanghai. I want to add like a pretend to walk away button. That was like my old negotiating tactic, but uh, nobody, everyone thinks I'm joking. So we haven't done that. Um, and, um, but you, you know, you can sort of acknowledge those orders and then convert those to a shipment and we'll ship them. We shipped to 112 countries last year. Uh, pretty excited that we've just, we've been in Canada for a little while, but we just launched our Toronto office, which is going to be our Canada HQ. We have a Vancouver office as well. Um, and so we'll deliver that all the way to the end user, all the way to your fulfillment centers who then pass it on to the end consumers or your stores and um, give you visibility the entire way, show you exactly what's happening. Everybody can communicate with everybody. We have uh, over 50, we have 47%, almost 50% of the truck drivers in the United States using our, uh, that do port trucking using our technology stack so that we can dispatch truck with no humans involved uh, for drayage. And um, we're, we've got now, we've deployed this in Canada. I don't know the, the market penetration. I'm sure it's not as high as it is in the U.S., but, um, but that's really powerful. So you'd be able to like see those goods actually where they are, when are they going to arrive at your warehouse? Because the drivers have our mobile app. And then if the warehouse wants to talk to the trucker, they don't have to talk to me who calls the trucking dispatcher who talks to the trucker, the warehouse and the trucker can just talk. So it's things like that. We're like, obviously tech can solve problems here that, um, that really differentiate us from like a traditional freight forwarding business. Yeah, that's amazing.
and I mean, I think both of our businesses have, have uh, benefited from the last couple of years and what's happened in supply chain. And so I'd love to hear more how that's maybe propelled Flexport. Um, and, you know, supply chain has never been more known or talked about by just anybody, right, in some of the chaos that we've seen. And so I'd love to hear your perspective on how that, that helped Flexport and, and what trends is it you're seeing, you know, moving forward. Um, yeah. Just, yeah. Hard for me to say it's benefited us. I think um, it's certainly made our customers pretty upset, rightfully so, right? Prices have gone to the moon. Uh, transit times have gone have fallen through the floor. It's a pretty ugly situation. Um, and we, for the last six, seven years, Flexport was able to grow without, like, incredibly fast. We went from last place, we did zero freight shipments in 2013, uh, to now in the United States, we're the third largest ocean freight and air freight provider, uh, NVO, sort of freight forwarding company in the United States, um, top 10 globally. I hope if we can get things continue on the same trend that we've been on, we'll be number one in, in two years or so. Uh, and I hope to do a similar trajectory in Canada. We're still much smaller, obviously, since we're newer in Canada. Um, that Part of that growth was that there was so much excess capacity that carriers were really happy to give us, if, if we could sell, if we could bring the customer on, we could get the space. Now, all of a sudden the ships are full. I think we are, I think we do have a, a, a we are relatively better, better than ocean carriers, in my view, than other freight forwarding customers. Um, we buy their, we're the number one seller of premium ocean freight, where you're sort of last on the boat, first off, guaranteed contain, equipment, guaranteed container or guaranteed space no role guarantees. We're the number one seller of those products on the Trans-Pacific um, into the West Coast of the U.S. Carriers make more money on those products. We're also more reliable because we use data science to project our... One of the things that has blown my mind is that 30% of all the ocean freight that's booked gets canceled and doesn't show up at the port. And this is a, you know, it's a, it's a vicious cycle that has to be broken somehow because ocean carriers are trying to plan their voyage and if 30% of the containers don't show up, it's like you don't make any money if you sail at 70%. You're definitely going to go bankrupt. So they have to overbook their ship. And then it makes all kinds of reliability problems because you're overbooked and then you end up having to roll containers. Um, and so we, I think we can position ourselves to be better for ocean carriers, but it's a much harder conversation in this environment where the ship is totally full. So for me to get one extra container, someone else has to get one less container. And, you know, that's, that's a tough conversation for them to have with customers that have been good, loyal customers for them for a long time. Uh, whereas in the old environment, there was excess capacity. That, you know, we were a great, uh, even a better partner for them. They, they loved the growth that Flexport was driving. So it's, it's been tough for us. It's hard to get the scale, you know, to get the space to deliver on customer promises. And we've had, to, we've had a waiting list for the last two years. We've, uh, in the United States, it's been, you know, we've been very selective about which customers we can onboard. We don't want to overpromise. Um, so I wouldn't say it's net, 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 net. It's been fine for us. We've become kind of famous. I don't know if you all see me. I've been on TV a lot. Like, was on I got four minutes, like, in the interview before we did this I, today. <laughs> I, I, 60 minutes took me on a helicopter. So net, net, like, I don't, it, it's, I, I, I do think Flexport, as a younger company, we're founder led. We're like, we're more, I, I, I pride ourselves on being more agile. Like we can adapt to change. I hope faster than most of our competitors are kind of like older, in my opinion, and obviously I'm biased, but like a little bit more bureaucratic. Yeah, the customers would want that, right? They want that that visibility. They want more flexibility. They want um, the ease of use so that they can start tracking. With, and, with, and some of it's like pure, it's not about all, it's not all tech. It's like, there's got to be this entrepreneurial spirit of like, let's go solve some problems. You know, like a great example was last year, um, when the when there wasn't enough PPE in the hospital networks in the in all over the world, it was a real tragedy. And we saw this, and we went and fifty percent of all the world's air freight flies in the belly of passenger planes, and those were all grounded during the pandemic, especially the Trans Pacific ones. So at the exact moment you need to ship more air freight than ever to get the PPE to hospitals in an emergency, all the airplanes are grounded. It's a, it's a real problem. And yet, if you just listen to the sentence. The solution is right in there. It's like, well, there's a bunch of passenger planes grounded. Let's call the airlines. And we were pretty much the only forwarder that did that, or at least the first one. We chartered 80 passenger planes, and we filled the masks into the seats and the overhead compartments and the belly and just 
shoveled almost 500 million units of PPE into five different continents of the healthcare system. That wasn't tech. That was like, hey, we're entrepreneurs. Like we're gonna we're gonna take action rapidly and solve problems. I, I I do think that that can be a real competitive advantage for any company. By the way, like we now live in a super chaotic world, and I I predict chaos is gonna get is just gonna increase. And if you can build your company to be better at observing what's going on taking in data from all the sources, like seeing problems, identifying those, getting those to the, getting those to the right team members, kind of rapidly assembling teams to go, okay, who needs to know about this information? What have we learned? What are we going to, uh, and then what decisions need to be made, take action. And then it's a loop, well, right? That, and then immediately go back and, and keep learning. Uh, like our you team, can win in, in a chaotic environment. Yeah. I agreed. Our team, when COVID hit, within a week of COVID, we had just closed Series A and we're, you know, the, between the, do we pull back on spend? Like, how do we, you know, move forward? And someone on the team offered that we should do this campaign to offer any company disrupted by COVID uh, to find suppliers. So if they had any disruption in their supply chain, we would do, uh, we would provide supplier lists with our search engine. And you know, within two weeks, we got 170 requests, help the, the UK government identify 60 thousand manufacturers of PPE ISO certified and and that propelled our pipeline and, and right it, it, it definitely yeah propelled our so it's uh yeah this ability right to take there. rapid action and like there's going to be more chaos than ever and like feel all these disciplines and business industries are more interrelated than they've ever been so you never used to have to worry about other things that were sort of exogenous they were outside your control they weren't they didn't matter that much like even the ocean freight, the ports like didn't matter that much to a business. They didn't have to think about it. It wasn't a problem. And all of a sudden it's like disrupting businesses that like, whoa, like you're getting you're getting hit from a lot of angles. And so you've got to really develop this culture of agility, the culture of rapid ability to rapidly experiment, test things, move, go fast go fast. I think it's something that can differentiate entrepreneurial sort of founder led companies that you know, there was nobody's job at Flexport who was to charter passenger planes to ship PPE to hospitals. Like that's not part of, nobody asked us to do it. And even, I was just like, let's do this. And we just, you know, I'm really, I, I'm not claiming that I came up with the idea, by the way, someone smart at Flexport did, but it's like, uh, that's the kind of spirit that that's needed to overcome the, the chaos. I And chaos is normal. And in supply chain, we've had, since Flexport started, we found it in 2013, 20. 14 was like a normal year, I think. Nothing crazy happened. 2015, in the United States, we had a West Coast port strike. Three months of no shipping. 2016, ocean freight hit the all-time lows. I hear everybody complaining about the price of ocean freight. Nobody was complaining in 2016 when you could ship a container from China to the U.S. for like 800 bucks or something. And Hanjin went bankrupt. Let's not forget, right? Ocean carriers have been under tremendous pressure for the last decade. Um, then 2017, 18, 19, Donald Trump every couple of weeks would launch a new tariff, like throwing everything into chaos. 2020, we had the pandemic and all that. 2021, the highest port congestion, the highest freight in history of the world. Maybe not, but in the containerized world. Uh, 2022, what's it going to bring? I think there's gonna, there might be another port strike that's under going to be under negotiation soon. 2013, we got 2023, we've got new IMO regs around carbon emissions like everything, from ships. Seems, everything seems to be more and faster. There's more disruptions. There's more changes. There's more regulations, more <laughs> requirements, yeah. right? And it's, it's not going to slow down. No, it's definitely not. And so I, I really think it's, it, one, you, you, uh, to win in that kind of an environment, you've got to be more agile. So you've got to be better at observing the world, which means taking in data. This is where companies like ours can help, like get you data. What's really happening right now? communication is part of data, like get real time, find out what's really happening on the ground at your supply chain throughout all the different nodes, be able to route around, uh, identify problems, identify bottlenecks, be able to quickly get that information to the right people inside your company and outside. These lines are going to continue to blur. Uh, and as you find more and more companies finding that actually maybe the best person to solve a problem doesn't work at your company, but you, they should, who cares? Invite them to the zoom call. Let's get them on the team. Right. Uh, and then make decisions and you got to be effective in making good decisions quickly. And some decisions need to be made slowly. So having real judgment to apply when is what's a one way door versus a two way door where you can cut, you know, if you can go back, like go really fast. If it's a one way door, take your time. 
uh, and then rapid action experimentation and then run the loop. That's just like table stakes, I think, in the future. And companies that do this are going to thrive in the chaotic environment that we're in and we'll continue, I, I predict we'll continue to be in for the rest of our lives. Companies that fail to do this are going to go by the wayside, um, that they're not able to adapt. You can see this in evolutionary history, by the way. The animals that adapt, that are able to like respond to environmental change are still with us. The dodo bird couldn't stand up to that and disappear. Um, and that's a natural force in the economy. And there's sort of this Darwinian like com companies that can't adapt die. And that's really sad. I think one of the things we want to do at Flexport is help. It's, it's very, very, very sad. If you look at the retail apocalypse, it's very real. You look at all the iconic retailers that have failed in the last five, five to 10 years. It doesn't need to be that way, you know, and we want to help companies be able to adapt to the trends of e-commerce and everything else that's going on in the world. 100%. With four minutes to go, I'd love to talk about why coming to Canada, what you're looking to achieve. And um, I'm assuming you're hiring people also in Canada, so creating employment. Where do you see some of the talent that you're um, able to leverage? Yeah, I mean, uh, Canada is just like an obvious extension. We, we we launched in Canada a few years ago, but we've been we decided to really double down and launch in Toronto. I think it's the, obviously the major business commercial hub of the country. And we, without being there, I don't think you're really on the boots on the ground in Canada to get the relationships you need with the decision makers and the customers. Um, it's like a, from a, from a, as an American, fat, we were founded in, in San Francisco. It's the easiest market in the world for us sort of culturally, geographically, it, carriers are the same coming in. It's a, it's, it's a relatively straightforward process for us to go and launch there versus like we're in 10 other countries that are much harder culturally and time zone wise and everything else. So it's a, it's a great market from that perspective. Actually, Canada on the freight side, for whatever historical reason, I'd love to know more of the history of this, but it's like 90% of the freight in Canada is managed, all the ocean freight is managed by freight forwarders. Um, rather than carrier direct to customers. Uh, so there's real opportunity for us to differentiate there and come in and be a great partner to the carriers and bring them, bring them customers. Whereas in the US, United States, I don't know the exact ratio, but it's, it's, much, it's much more like 60, 40 or something in terms of freight where a carrier sell direct to a, to a customer and there's not as much role for the freight forwarder. Um, so it's great market from that perspective. Uh, so yeah, just like lots of great reasons to come to Canada. I'm a huge, huge Canadian junkie. Uh, I love to go skiing too. I hope that I get to do some business in Calgary and combine it with my ski trips. So skiing is better when you go to Vancouver, but <laughs> I'm a big skier myself. Um, and so, and what do you, how do you see this impacting just what's happening in the world right now? Like we're seeing a lot of uh, diversification, uh, the desire to relocate supply chains from Asia, for example, to North America, um, is this something that you're seeing and how do you see this, you know, changing possibly around, you know, risk versus globalization and sort of that full circle? I, I think the longer these problems continue and right now, this morning, there are 50 ships waiting off, off the coast of Vancouver, uh, versus like seven last week. I mean, I think it's very, hopefully very, very temporary with the floods and the railhead there, but, um, if you can't depend on global freight, and it takes 70 days to get something delivered, you're going to have to rethink things. And if it, and the prices stay where they are, it's inevitable that businesses will adapt and shift. Um, are they going to bring it to the United States or Canada for manufacturing? I don't know that we have the cost competitive basis for that. Uh, but Latin America is certainly going to be a winner uh, if this continues. I don't know when it will resolve. And I think that's part of the problem that if companies had certainty that this was going to last, they would have already made the shift, many of them. But if you're not certain, then it's very hard to make such a dramatic change. Um, now, it also depends on the industry. Like there are certain industries, uh, consumer electronics in particular, that like the ecosystem is way too strong in southern China that you really can't pick up and move. I mean, you would know this better than me, but like certain industries you can't move. Others that you can have been moving for a long time. Um, I, I met with an ocean carrier, I want to say like five or six years ago at TPM, the big ocean freight conference out of Long Beach, who told me they were moving thousands of containers a year of used manufacturing equipment from China to Vietnam, uh, just, you know, just wholesale sort of shipping factories down to Vietnam. That's, that's an inevitable force in business of like moving to lower cost labor um, sources. But uh, you'll see more of that if the supply chain congestion sticks. And I don't want that to be the mechanism by which this resolves. Like, I think 
it's 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 it would be a really sad thing. They're like, oh, good, like now everything's fine because we ship less stuff. Like, actually, we should be like, everything's fine because we've improved the capacity of the network. We've improved the throughput and there's more freight than ever rather than like, oh, we've reduced the amount of freight. Now we're good. That would be that would be sad for the economy. Like we should be in the midst of a a golden age of boom. Like consumers are buying more stuff than ever. Should be awesome for all the brands and awesome for all the logistics providers. But instead, if, if in fact, what happens is people say, I can't trust ocean freight anymore. I'm going to move my manufacturing to Mexico. Uh, uh, certainly that would be bad for our industry, right? And um, not not the outcome that we're looking for. Yeah, well, you think with a lot more data visibility, like where we're heading, right? It's forcing change. And so to your point, I think that it may be temporarily, so there's going to be some diversification and localization happening. But as the, the market is figuring this out, because they, you know, it needs to open up again, I think there's going to be, that demand for more visibility, more transparency, the ability to track in real time, the opportunity to be able to take action in real time, right? To be able to find to find and act on contingency plans. And that's that's one of the things we talk a lot about is it's great to have a contingency plan, but if you don't have the data and the information to take action, then it's just a plan. <laughs> and and so, supply chain company. managers' jobs are harder than ever because on the on the supply side, you're like, oh, I can't rely on a single source, whether it's congestion or tariffs geopolitical issues or quarantines like you, you need diversified supply sources so you and now all of a sudden your your complexity just multiplied 5x on the supply side and then demand side i already talked about how you need to have inventory positioned close to the customers and you're probably more global than ever if you're not your global competitors are going to show up in your market right or for you to show up in their market uh and so like your complexity is just compounded you used to have like one origin and one destination you could do this on the phone now you've got eight origins, and if you want to have two-hour delivery, you got 18 or in Canada, probably 18 different DCs at destination. Eight times 18 is a lot bigger than one. Um, and so, that, and yet, budgets are getting cut. People have less resources. Nobody's trying to spend more money on this area. Certainly not right now. Uh, they're already spending too much. So it's a real hard problem. And I think the supply supply chain teams are under a huge amount of pressure. I hope technology like ours can give you some tools to help wrestle this monster and get you some level, some degree of control over all the complexity that's emerging. And the consumers are more demanding than ever on transparency, on speed. Right? So they won't have the patience and they won't have the customers tolerance. Customers are in charge. Consumers are yeah. in charge. The internet, like in the old world, brands were in charge. They had mass media. They had a megaphone. No one can talk back to them. They can run ads and like they're, they're in charge. But now customers are in charge. They can get whatever they want right now from, if not from you then from your competitor and they don't have any patience they want it right now like in two hours if i don't get my you know if i don't get my socks delivered in two hours i'm gonna someone else will if you don't amazon will somebody else will so um that's a really hard problem to solve and i, I hope that it doesn't lead to more bankruptcies of great retailers and great brands and companies that make great products you'd like to live in a world where like you just make great products and that's all it takes but well, increasingly, you've got to have an awesome... Yeah, I mean, the ESG, What I think the good news from that front is we're, you know, companies that didn't care, didn't not didn't care, but didn't need to do anything about it right now, we're seeing a huge surge in, um, you know, wanting to do business with small, diverse businesses, want to do business with companies who are sustainable, who have, you know, carbon emission goals and things like that. So I think that change is really positive. If you combine the two, speed and, you know, corporate social responsibility of companies you get the bit of the best of both worlds the, the changes are all positive if you can get through them if you can make them happen you run a much better business you're more agile you're better for the world you're better for your customers everything's awesome it's just hard to do and uh yeah so hopefully there's roles for technology to help people make this transition and, and set it up i see that we are over time yeah, here I so let's thank everybody for your time we really appreciate you all joining us today thank you stephanie for for uh joining me and on uh, this conversation and hope to Hang out with folks in Toronto when I get up there, which shouldn't be too long. I'm definitely coming up in Q1. And uh, I, last time I was in Toronto, I saw an ad on television that still sticks with me for a curling shoe. And I don't know if curling is really popular in Canada, but when I come, I want to do a customer event. We'll all go curling together. So you all consider yourself <laughs> invited. We're going to do a big flex board curling and a party up in uh, Toronto. Sounds good, Ryan. Thank you so much for having me. Welcome to Canada. We're excited to have you guys. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.